Okay. <clears throat> so we Gabeser scholars are an optimistic lot. We tend to see the structures of consciousness in terms of human growth. And we tend to see the mutations in terms of humanity turning into something better. The teleology of our worldview ends in a good place. Humankind goes from savage roots to integrality. We have room in our worldview for negative moments and negative places and negative spaces. We classify those as deficient and with broken hearts or with wagging fingers we move on. Indeed, every discussion we have is a discussion of minutes or hours or days or eons. We make arguments to understand the theoretical approach that explains the changing economy, shifting global fortunes, differing opportunities in education, skepticism toward achievement and toward government, a resurgence of fundamentalists, fundamentalist religions, as Steve just talked about, changing demographics, immigration, and the rise of secularisms. Fragment, fragment, fragment. So I find myself in a difficult moment because I'm living in a difficult moment. Working from the metaphor of the perfect storm, many have discussed the present moment in American politics as the coming together of the displaced. Many have written about the left behinds, Hillary Clinton's deplorables, those still in the coal mines, those for whom globalization is just an ugly word but not a bringer of any tangible benefits. We've seen those types of people come out at Trump rallies and on social media to say, what about me? Where's my slice of the pie? Who will fight for me? And we've seen the response. I will fight for you, says Mr. Trump. I will be there for you, he says. Many have asked, how does this happen? How did it come together like this? What happened to my country? What happened to this world? How is it that we see the resurgence of so many deficient magics that we thought were a thing of the past? How can it be that racism and anti-Semitism and misogyny and anti-immigrant hysteria can be so openly practiced, not just by average people, but by the leader of the free world? Our model includes global shifts of capital the last vestiges of the North American Manufacturing Company that, uh, co co uh, sorry, uh, the North American Manufacturing Economy that shift away from the shift away from fossil fuels, and those who produced them, the concomitant rise of fundamentalist religion and secularism, war-generated refugee crises that changed the demographics of nations, giving rise to the nationalisms, differing attitudes toward opportunities for education population growth, climate change, the demise of the baby boom generation. It seems like every day another one of our rock gods passes through the western gate. And the rise of the larger millennial generation. The arrival of social media and its effects on interpersonal communication. Putting that phone down. Fragmentation. 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 The American president stood in the UN General Assembly days ago and proclaimed globalization is dead. The future belongs to patriots. And of course, America is great. But chaos isn't the absence of order. Chaos is a type of order. My wife jokes that when they turned on the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, we entered into a parallel universe in which Donald Trump became president. <laughs> You've missed out. She's definitely the smarter of the two of us. <laughs> they say it's the shift in U.S. demographics. They say their way of life is threatened. Whether that's an all-white neighborhood, or the extraction of more coal, or the Confederate battle flag, or a statue of somebody who is certainly not my hero. They see any of that, all of that, as a sign. Hold aside the repugnance, the spectacle. It's undeniable that the millions of people rallying for Trump have had some sort of convergence. Many argue that this is the first president to fight for them. This is the first administration, they believe, that's on their side, at least since Andrew Jackson, whose portrait hangs 
in the Oval Office. It is, of course, hard to reconcile that worldview with statistical fact, but people's perceptions are their reality. And the overlapping shared reality of millions of Trump supporters, no matter how delusional, is real. Yes, we can see all of the deficiencies through our model. Let's start with magic. I will get to archaic later. We can see the deficient magic of what it means to be an American by looking at the homogeneity of the crowd at any of the rallies. In my part of Northern California, I don't see many Trump bumper stickers. But when I do, it's most likely on a vehicle driven by a middle-aged or older white person. While I acknowledge this is anecdotal, the many photographs from Trump's many rallies are not. More to the point, the administration's immigration policies, which target specifically non-Caucasians, almost exclusively reveal a deficient magic view of citizenship. As Kramer and others, myself included, have written, blood is magic, blood is idolic. Gabser himself observed it in Nazi Germany where the Nuremberg Laws determined citizenship and stripped citizenship from Jews and anyone else who failed the most twisted blood test ever. This administration has all but said that U.S. citizenship is reserved for a specific type of immigrant, none from the so-called shithole countries. Need apply. The administration began with the Muslim ban, shot down by the courts, and then reformulated to be even more comprehensive. Hispanic and Latin U.S. citizens in borderlands have had their passports revoked by a federal government. That's U.S. passports revoked by a federal government that questions the validity of their birth documents. Naturalized citizens have had their citizenship revoked. The administration, helmed by a five-time draft dodger, has expelled non-citizens from the United States military, removing service to the nation as a pathway to citizenship. Of course, most of the publicity is centered around the shocking way that the administration has separated families and incarcerated them. The most emotional images of the George W. Bush administration may have been the cargo planes full of flag-draped coffins returning from Iraqi and Afghan battlefields. For the current administration, it may be the plane full of infant car seats used to transport children to detention camps or photos of the camps themselves. Some of which hold children in, quote, dirty and deplorable conditions. I'm going to take that off because it's just too alarming. 2,654 children, according to the ACLU, were separated from their parents. All of this would be disturbing on its own. Immigration enforcement in any nation is never pleasant. The UK has had some high profile immigration cases lately. On American shores, we have heard about US citizens being denial, denied a review, re renewal of their UK residency after a long time, or worse, their families facing deportation while they themselves are allowed to stay in the UK. This is especially true in the academic world, incidentally. Sad stories to be sure, but with a major difference, as the American cases are largely based on race, religion, or ethnic origin. Trump's immigration policies are deficient magic. US immigrants cannot be Muslims, quote, until we find out what the hell is going on. Afro-Caribbean, African, or Latin, as the president himself said on January 28th, 20, uh, 2018, why do we need more Haitians? Take them out. He went on to say that, quote, we should have more people from places like Norway. Trump's openness about wanting Scandinavian immigrants instead of non-whites is deficient magic because it privileges white race and blood over all else. Trump's preference was not about economics, level of education, or social class. It was purely, it is purely about race and religion. Let's turn to deficient myth. In addition to the deficient magic of immigration, the maggot worldview is based on deficient myth as well. The idea of, quote, making America great again is based on unclear signifiers. Who is the maker in the making of American greatness again? Presumably, the maker is Trump, who uses all of his special powers. At, at the time that I wrote this, was, it was the very day he boasted about his, quote, great and unmatched wisdom. Thus, it will be Trump who does all the making. 
And let's look at what that looks like and how he could do it. Nobody. Nobody can do that. Honestly. Nobody's stronger than me. Nobody has better toys than I do. There's nobody bigger or better at the military than I am. Nobody loves the Bible more than I do. Nobody knows bills better than me. Nobody's better. There are people with disabilities than me. Nobody's fighting for the veterans like I'm fighting for the veterans. There's nobody that's done so much for equality as I have. There's nobody more pro-Israel than I am. There's nobody more conservative than me. There's nobody that respects women more than I do. Nobody. Oh, I think that you could probably predict the rest of the video. <laughs> Thus, it will be Trump who does the making. Yet the making of American greatness, again, also depends on millions of followers attending rallies, responding obsequiously to a constant barrage of Trump tweets and Facebook posts, and buying merchandise. from the official Trump store. Hats, shirts, you can get a, a doormat, flags made in China, from the Trump store. And it's your patriotic duty to buy that stuff. And of course, supporting Trump endorsed candidates. While it does not seem to require, what it, what it does not seem to require from anyone is any concrete action. Though Trump boasts record unemployment, those claims are lies. Like the Obama administration before his, the current one simply deletes anyone who maxes out on unemployment benefits. And now it also counts anyone who works 10 hours a week as, quote, fully employed. Thus, the idea of making is so muddy that it cannot rationally be understood. America is also an unclear signifier, as the administration has all but declared war on states like New York, Massachusetts, and most especially, California. Trump has withheld aid from US territory Puerto Rico, saying or implying that he'd rather help citizens. Of course, Puerto Ricans are citizens. <laughs> He also complained about the president of Puerto Rico, which, by the way, is named Donald Trump. <laughs> so I did agree with him at one point. He's attempting to revoke the state controls, California state controls on pollution emitting cars while simultaneously threatened to sanction us for pollution. He's done nothing to improve the water in Flint, Michigan, effects of the changing climate on the residents of Alaska, or mobilized a federal response to massive hurricanes in the South. It's truly unclear what America the president is talking about when you see the combination of inaction and of counteraction coming from the White House. Likewise, the idea of great is equally unclear. If greatness is the undoing of political correctness, then I must concede that Donald Trump has been successful in his mission. I'm old enough to remember when David Letterman was fined for saying ass on late night te television. When profanity came with a warning label on records. But the president has, with no consequence, made fun of the disabled, used racist language, used anti-Semitic dog whistles and open slurs, and used the most vulgar terms about female anatomy. Moreover, we've seen newspapers and TV networks repeat unedited terms that the president has used, like shithole countries, and just last week, the bullshit impeachment probe. He's made playing the victim an art form which resonates with much of his base, who feel left behind in the current cultural and economic reality. In short, he has been a wrecking ball to decency. He's used the Republican canard against PC culture as a cudgel against any vestiges of decency left in this culture. There seem to be no limits anymore to what he can say. Further, one must question how greatness can be measured. Trump takes credit for each rise in the stock market, ignoring or shifting blame when the Dow and other indicators fall. Absent from the discussion is the deep damage his trade war has done to agriculture, which has required to date more than $24 billion in bailouts, which is more than Obama paid the auto industry, which, if you remember, raised Republican ire. 
Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue recently told farmers that only large agribusiness will survive this. The family farm is dead. Also absent from the White House talking points is any mention of the staggering debt and deficit. The government not only lacks a plan to reduce the deficit, which last month hit over $1 trillion, they refuse to even discuss it. As Dick Cheney said, deficits don't matter, at least not when a Republican is president. Finally, we get to the last signifier, again. This is one of the most pernicious of all, as it makes clear that America has lost its greatness. On that, I must agree with the president. Our schools fare poorly in international comparisons. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Millions of California, including critical infrastructure like hospitals and gas stations, went without power this week. I needed to stop for gas on the way here. It was the fifth gas station I hit that actually was open. The homeless crisis has brought plague and cholera to Los Angeles. Americans cannot afford health care. This past week, I saw an ad online, this is not a joke, in which someone was selling their autographed MAGA hat to cover the cost of medical bills. U.S. law enforcement continue to shoot and kill African-American males in astounding numbers, and the rate of incarceration and the disproportionate rate of African-American incarceration is a festering wound this administration refuses to acknowledge. Until recently, the rise of white supremacist terror was ignored by this administration, which I and other experts argue has been, it has been complicit. Stepping back, it's not clear at all what again means. What year was America great? In what era? Much like the term freedom in political ads, again is a polysemic term, but its meaning seems to be clear for a lot of followers. The era when white male Christian Americans were not forced to be part of a diverse crowd. When their privilege meant they did not have to explain their, themselves or accommodate anyone of any other faith or cultural group. When men had control over women and their bodies. Greatness, apparently, is about being able to grab them. To restrict access to all forms of birth control. To keep brown bodies imprisoned. And to prevent more brown bodies from crossing the border and to say Merry Christmas to your Jewish neighbor. In sum, making America great again is based on deficient myth that ignores historical reality. Many Latins, after all, did not come here. As the activist chant goes, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. We're standing in a state named in Spanish for an African queen as maggots try to take us back to a reality that never existed. The administration and its followers rely on nostalgia for a largely false history to create a future which is untenable and socially disastrous. Let's talk about the mental rational. As if the aforementioned deficient math and myth and magic were not damaging enough to the fabric of this society and the impact our disillusion has on the world writ large, we're witnessing a deficient mental rational that I believe is paralleled only by Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, and Mao-era China. Each of these three cases, now four, must be understood in the most chilling part of their context. Their sins were not crimes according to their own domestic legal systems. That is, the first victims of each of their regimes were the laws that would have made those later crimes impossible. Our current administration is not Nazi Germany, or Stalinist Russia, or Mao's China, of course, and we hope it never will be. I do not mean to draw such a parallel. I resist the Trump as Hitler comparison. I do not mean to draw such a parallel. I, uh, Trump is certainly not 1942 Hitler, but he is trying to be 1934 Hitler in search of his Reichstag fire. Trump has taken the growing imperial presidency that we saw under Bush and Obama and intensified it to the extent that he now openly defies congressional subpoenas and legal decisions. This is alarming, but it should not be surprising. As I wrote on election night, ultimately our entire system rests on a gentleman's agreement and <laughs> we're fresh out of gentlemen. This far, and even this morning, the courts have been our only check on executive power this morning an appeals court 
overruled Trump about the uh, release of documents. As George Will wrote yesterday, Congress has been unable or unwilling to assert its oversight power. George Will, that notorious communist. <laughs> Absent such oversight, it falls on the courts to stop the criminal acts of this administration, but the legal system works slowly and is guided by interpretation. Another aspect of our times in the mental rational is the rejection of authority. Tom Nichols calls this the death of expertise. In my view, this has several roots. First, the rise of, cer of strain, certain strains of fundamentalist religion has warred against many things, including Darwin, sex education, public schools, and environmentalism. Second, much libertarianism has rejected lots of things, including environmentalism, government, structure. Third, many, including New Age people, have rejected Western medicine, including vaccines. Fourth, a dangerous postmodernism has rendered all claims tentative and equally valid, or invalid, if you prefer. Finally, many conservatives are hostile toward higher education to the extent that universities are now being written off as unfixable. Pseudoscience, quackery, and outright ignorance create an anti-intellectual environment. Knowledge is bad. Feeling is good. Science is bad news. You know, climate change is a Chinese economic plot. Actual Russian plots are fake news. The path of a hurricane can be changed with a sharpie. And nobody is allowed to tell the emperor that he's naked. As such, it should come as no surprise that our entire legal and scientific systems are twin expressions of He shaved his goatee. <laughs> Empiricism. <laughs> I'm so glad you did because the line wouldn't have played. <laughs> Empiricism, the cornerstone of the modern scientific method, is negated and rendered impotent in the face of a cultural moment in which we are continuously told that what we see and what we hear is false. Almost daily we're told that the president did not say what we all saw and heard him say. The president did not break laws that we all witnessed him breaking. In August 2019, Politics USA reported that Trump, who said as a candidate that he would be too busy to play golf while president, has spent 278 years of presidential salary on his 207 taxpayer-funded golf trips post-election. He has not violated the emoluments clause, even as we've seen everyone from foreign leaders to business executives to the Attorney General of the United States booking rooms at Trump hotels. Thinkprogress.org reports that the US Secret Service spent $216,254 just at Trump's DC hotel from September of 2016 to February of 2018. And Trump has a house in town. It's DC. So we're in a cultural moment where science and law are discredited, perverted, or ignored. Of course, not all of this is Trump's doing. Much of it preceded him, but he has tapped into it, coalescing it into his base and into his message. Doing so further dismantles the mental rational, exhibiting a deficient version. In this contest, we must acknowledge that the Trump follower has an internal logic, no matter how deficient we may find the consciousness. We speak here of the climate emergency, but many Trump followers see a national and cultural emergency. While I raise alarms about the dangers of a rising ethno-theocratic state, they fear the loss of their white Christianist nation. They fear the racial, ethnic, national, religious, and sexual diversity that they feel is invading their space and stealing their country from them. They reject what they see as government invasion of their lives. They feel that their religious freedom is abrogated by laws that prevent them from discriminating against Jews, against same-sex couples, or mixed-race families. They reject any environmental laws, many of which they see as conspiracies perpetuated by China, or George Soros, or lizard people, or some other sinister force. The GOP plays on this fear with a rhetoric that pits environmental protection against working-class jobs. Coupled with the current administration's policies against any and all renewable energy sources, Teddy Roosevelt's nature-preserving Republican Party, at least for the time being, is gone. The Center for American Progress wrote that although Trump signed the John Dingell Jr. Conservation Management and Recreation Act, 
that protected more than 1.3 million acres of wilderness and blocked more than 370,000 acres of public land from mining, the Trump administration has spent its time in office stripping protections from a staggering 13.5 million acres of American land and water. But in the deficient mental rational in which the illegal is legal, or at least indistinguishable from legal, the irrational is rational, or at least indistinguishable from rational, and the false is true, or at least indistinguishable from true, fear drives people to see all the changes in demographics, economics, and politics as signs that Trump is, as hundreds of write on social media every day, the first president to tell the truth and the first president to fight for them. Earlier this week, oh, sorry, Trump's evangelical supporters can do, can and do brush off his profanity, his crudeness, his adultery, his payoff to a porn star for adulterous sex because this is their time and he's their man. Earlier this week, Ralph Reed has a new book. He announced a new book, which is called For God and Country, The Christian Case for Trump. That wasn't the original title. The original title was Ren Render to God and Trump. Some in the Gabeser community have suggested the existence of a deficient integral, which I have heard described as sort of an anti-matter version of the integral. I do not agree with this concept, and nor do I think would Gabeser. Integrality, I think, has no deficient mode. That is its nature. So while it is tempting to say that, that we see deficient magic myth mental rational consciousness expressed in the primal screams at rallies and the acts of violence inspired by Trump's rhetoric in a deficient archaic, I do not believe that this is proof of a deficient integral. I think it precludes the integral. It prevents transparency. It inhibits growth. It negates the growth mutation of integral consciousness. What I think we see is retribalizing. We see the most deficient of deficient modes. We're witnessing a malignant narcissist elevating selfishness to a position of existential supremacy. What Trump has done more than any violation he has committed is to have unleashed and made acceptable that selfish urge, not just for himself, but for everyone else as well. Inasmuch as this is happening, we see the denial and negation of anything beyond the id, and that, in and of itself, is the manifestation of the deficient mental rational. Thank you. Well, my question is, <laughs> when are you running for office? <laughs> My skeletons have skeletons. <laughs> uh, questions? Thank you, Dr. Z. Um, so you said that uh, integrality by its nature is not deficient. Correct. Can you explain that a little bit? Because integrality is when the efficient modes of each of these consciousness structures emerge in a transparent way. So anything that holds that back would be, by definition, inhibiting integrality. And I don't think there can be a mirror image of integrality. I, I have to be fair to say that there are some Gabeser scholars who disagree. I, I just, I can't see it. Thing on. <laughs> it doesn't matter anyway. Um, Gabeser says the efficient always begins a new consciousness era. So, I mean, that does it. But how do you see the, the integration of the Epirion, of the chaos, uh, of the efficient magical, and uh, all of that? How does that work? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that the seeds of of the efficient are in the deficient, right? And I, I, I know that Glenn will talk about that later. Um, I think that we, we have a, a responsibility to move beyond the walls of this room and try to 
enable the efficient and try to call attention to the efficient, which is a hard task right now. So um, a lot of what you spoke about, well, a, a little bit, was um, how Trump is mobilizing the polarities. And I'm wondering how, so, so in, in some ways he's bringing paradox into reality. In another way I see it as it's not real paradox. It's, it's like self-contradiction. Um, what Steve talked about this morning, about being able to handle you know, the, the uncertainty, the ambiguity, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you see whether this mobilization of of paradox or pseudo paradox as being like part of what's necessary to get to integrality or if you see it as just confusing the issue? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, there's a lot to that question. So I, I probably will answer it in an inadequate way. But I, I think that one of the major problems that we face is not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the effect He's not the cause, right? If it weren't Trump, it would be someone else. Um, part of the problem is, is this collective inability to deal with ambiguity. You know, in, in my studies of terrorism, I find that terrorists have, regardless of what, what their cause is, whether it's religious terrorists, environmental terrorists, whatever, they have a low tolerance for ambiguity, which we can measure. There's an instrument for it. And one of the things that we aren't good at socially in this society is teaching people to be OK with ambiguity. And we find that places where people are tolerant of ambiguity, people get along and people are successful, California being one of them. We really have to, teachers, starting with you know, nursery school, have to cultivate an understanding and an appreciation for the, ambigu for the ambiguous, which is why I think the conversation that we've had about art is so important, because art is about ambiguity. And yet, even people who don't like art will like art that is unambiguous. That's part of our problem. First of all, love to you, Dave. I, <laughs> I, just, hope. <laughs> I just, I just, and and thank you, thank you for uh, your presentation. Thank you for all that you do, really. And uh, um, I'm not going to. I'm going to try to simply pose a question to you. Um, I just was a little puzzled when you seem to be saying that. Uh, that uh, the current situation is negating all transparency. Did you say that? Or? I don't know that I went that far. OK. But I, I, I think that, I think that we are, th certainly the administration is actively trying to negate transparency. In certain respects. Yeah. Right. And in other respects, it's, and so, sometimes Trump says things that no president would ever say. Right. You know, which are actually transparent. For instance, at Charlottesville, when he said, you know, George Washington was a slave owner, Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. They were slave owners, you know, and, but I've never heard any other president in my lifetime say that. <laughs> so, I mean, the other, the other question I have about it is, uh, uh, around ambiguity, and I, I totally agree that we need to cultivate that. But Trump is this unusual phenomenon, this, 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 this paradox, in a way, all the time, because it's not true 
paradox, perhaps, as Lisa was saying, but, but he can, and often does, contradict himself within sure. a single sentence. Sure. So, so, uh, so can you speak to how that particular use of kind of a smokescreen, an ambiguity, is used in, in, in perhaps sinister ways and, or, or not? Because I know you know a great deal about that. I think that he uses those things, that smokescreen, the way you put it, yeah. because in a way that he takes cover, right? So his adultery isn't adultery because he loves the Bible more than anyone else, right? If he didn't love the Bible so much, then it would be adultery. But clearly it can't be because he loves the Bible, which is written in, you know, 2 Corinthians. But, uh, but, but I think that it's interesting because he is transparent in a way. So that quote, for example, about Washington and Jefferson, right, we have to give the context of the quote. Because the context of the quote was, therefore, we should leave the Robert E. Lee statue up because our so-called heroes are no better. Which is completely not transparent. It's the opposite of transparency. So it's, it's phony transparency. It's a little bit of transparency, but it is, it is encased in something that is opaque. Right? It doesn't create a national dialogue about the slave-owning uh, founders of the nation because it's used as a talking point to justify the, the Confederate statues staying in place. And so in my mind, that's not transparency. No, that doesn't make it so. That's just one man's opinion. But I think we can see case by case by case where he does that. Which, again, I think it, it plays into a lot of what you're going to talk about, about being a trickster. And so I don't want to step on your toes too much, because I think you're going to have a lot to say about that. I live in Trump country. I'm sorry. I live in, it's as red as you can get. Well, maybe you should stay here. <laughs> so, a point to make on this. Most of those people did not really vote for Trump. They voted against. Sure. And so where are we? A few of them voted for him because he would make things so chaotic, something has to change. Right. Burn it all down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, I mean, yesterday Fox released a poll in which Fox, in which Trump trails the top three Democrats. But that was a fake poll. Right, right, <laughs> right. No, it wasn't a fake poll. It's that Fox's pollster sucks. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say about the ambiguity um, in being an acupuncturist and working with people that I, I would say that one of the biggest issues that I confront with people is their ambiguity and the whole idea that the the way of healing is just learning how to manage life's ambiguity, that that's the trick. So I just wanted to give that as a comment. But I, you also, and maybe I missed it, and, and forgive me if this is like an ignorant question, but I want you to say something about the deficient archaic, if you would. That's a tall order. You said you were going to Yeah, well, I, I said it was the primal scream. I said that at the end that the primal scream at the, I believe that the primal scream that we're hearing, whether it's taking the, the form of lock her up or it's taking the form of, you know, beat him up or kick him out or whatever, that that primal scream and that violence, which, which it's no longer opinion that whether Trump is inspiring violence, people who have committed violence have said so, right? I think that's the deficient archaic. We have one more. Thank you, David. Um, two things. I'm having trouble with the words paradox and ambiguity. <laughs> when it comes to doublespeak, sure. there's a big difference between ambiguity, something that's up in the air, and bullshit. Right. So I just wanted to say that out loud. <laughs> and Which one of those was my presentation? <laughs> You were, you, were, you were neither paradoxical nor ambiguous. <laughs> you are not ambiguous about your political position. Um, but the second thing is you've given me a project. Because integrality is an archetype. And as I said earlier, an archetype has two poles. So I think that we're charged with, with thinking about 
the negative aspect of integrality. I, I will say this, and I think it's really important. Integrality, these consciousness structures are not manifest in individuals. Right? This is a socio-cultural level phenomenon. Right? This is one of the things we have to recognize. We can't say, I'm feeling integral today. Like that's, you know, that's, that's not an internal thing. That's, you know, it's beyond us. So it's a cultural archetype, not a personal archetype. Right. Yeah. Would it be uh, disintegration? Yeah. Um, on an archetypal level? Mm -hmm. Uh, just commenting on, on the deficient integral, um, if I recall correctly, Gabster didn't really say too much about it. He did mention the possibility that it would be, how do you describe it, a void, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just making, I'm thinking out loud here and making a connection between the archaic and the integral, because he does say that the archaic is the latent integral that right. is sort of the seed form of the integral. Right. So I wonder if there are parallels or convergences we can make between the deficient archaic and the deficient quote, void. Integral. Yeah, and maybe, maybe. Yeah, along those lines, um, if one wants to try and imagine something like the deficient integral, um, if you take a authentic image of the divine, name it God, or name it Christ, or what have you, then the antithesis of that would be classically or traditionally, I mean, the symbol we have is the devil or the antichrist, for instance. Um, it would be kind of the uh, unific factor, um, yeah, the antithesis thereof. And if you look at someone like, like Trump, um, who isn't naive, um, in the mode that you might think of, you know, an ar archaic, um, archa deficient archaic, you would think is not intelligent necessarily. But anything like a deficient integral would be the corruption, total corruption of uh, maximal intelligence, like Lucifer, like the Antichrist, which. Um, so that's just a kind of symbolic way of thinking about maybe a placeholder for, and I agree with you that wouldn't really be the, the integral, the deficient integral isn't integral at all, but it is, it is kind of um, something that has tremendous power that's the end. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I would call attention to uh, what Eric Kramer has written about modern and postmodern, saying that postmodern is modern. And Steve mentioned something along those lines this morning. I've written about it, um, that postmodern isn't different from modern enough to be a different thing. Uh, and modernity resides in postmodernity. You know, if it were truly different, postmodernity would have to be able to exist without modernity, and it can't. And so, um, and that's a very large discussion, but I appreciate your point.